Thanks for tuning in tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be starting in three minutes. Water. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our special webinar tonight as we discuss American history with acclaimed filmmaker Ken Burns. There are already hundreds of you joining us tonight from places like Pennsylvania, California, Colorado, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, Kentucky. Our focus tonight is on you as we talk with Ken Burns. Uh, we're going to focus on you, the educators and students, as we march toward the end of a very unusual school year. Whether you're preparing for AP exams, figuring out how to weave together big ideas that you focused on all year long, or just trying to make sense of virtual learning, our goal is to support you. What we are going to do together is to talk about some of the themes of American history and learn from a master about how he brings those to life on film. We'll also have some practical tools for teachers and students to emphasize engagement and student choice. And most importantly, we'll also take your questions. Before we get started, let's introduce you to the teacher moderators for this webinar. I'm David Olson. I've spent the last decade of my teaching career as a high school social studies teacher at James Madison Memorial High School in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a PBS Digital Innovator All-Star, and in my next life, I'm hoping to narrate Ken Burns films. <laughs> Nice, David. Hi, my name is Paige Somoza and I'm from Boise, Idaho. I'm currently an instructional coach for the Boise School District and I too am a PBS Digital Innovator All-Star. Um, before assuming my current role, I was a history teacher for 14 years in the secondary classroom and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And I'm Larissa Wright Elson. I've been an educator in Anchorage, Alaska for almost 22 years. I was a secondary, um, as in middle and high school, uh, English and language arts teacher for most of that time, collaborating really closely with my colleagues teaching social studies and history. I'm now the ELA curriculum coordinator for the Anchorage School District. I'm also a PBS digital innovator and a huge history buff. 
I am thrilled this evening or this afternoon here in Alaska uh, to introduce Ken Burns. Ken has been a docu documentary filmmaker for over 40 years. Uh, from the Brooklyn Bridge to the Dust Bowl, Vietnam to the Civil War, Ken has directed and produced some of the most acclaimed historical documentaries ever made. His impact on the teaching of American history, in particular, investigating our American identity is second to none. Mr. Burns's filmography includes pivotal moments in America, like the Central Park Five and Prohibition, as well as American icons like baseball, jazz, and country music. Today, we welcome you to, again, very friendly and familiar territory on PBS, uh, this time to speak directly with all of us educators. Welcome, Ken. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you know, these are incredibly uh, difficult times. We're in the middle of history being made right before our eyes, uh, an unprecedented time. And I want to make sure that everybody just remembers to stay safe and to follow the instructions, take care of yourself, take care of other people. Remember, there are a lot of people running towards this uh, disaster and not away from it. And we should keep them in our hearts and our minds. And uh, I'm thrilled at the end of, for many of you, in the middle of, for others of you, a very busy day. And our days are strangely busier than they've ever been before, that you take the time where we could have a conversation and remind us of how we might reimagine our country, how we might restitch ourselves together using all of the evidence and all of the great teaching that the past continually offers us. And so I'm very much looking forward to being in conversation with you all uh, this evening today. Oh, thank you so much, Ken. Um, one of the things that makes your film so meaningful is your ability to connect themes within American history across time periods and subjects. Um, I'm hoping you can begin by telling us what American themes you think are particularly important and how, how you try to bring them out in your films. Well, it's interesting. I think after the uh, fact page, it's easy to kind of reverse engineer and say, well, this is what we did. In point of fact, what we try to do is focus intently on the story we have to tell and to tell it well, engage the best scholarship on the subject, find as many of the archives, still photographs, footage, if that's available, paintings, graphics that we can find, mold it into a coherent narrative. What is so interesting, though, is that every time we finish a film and look up, and we've been doing this for more than four decades, we begin to look around and see ourselves in the funny position of having themes that resonate with the present moment in whatever film we've undertaken. It's been eerie, and in the beginning, it was kind of flabbergasting. Now we expect it. We are disciplined enough not to try to do that because it would actually, in the end, ruin the films. However, if you accept the idea that Mark Twain is supposed to have said history doesn't uh, repeat itself, but it rhymes, um, that what he was saying in essence is that human nature doesn't change. And, and so we superimpose that human nature over the, the, the random series of events that present themselves to us. And you begin patterns emerge and themes emerge. And in our country, it seems to me, the ones that just constantly zing out of almost every film is you have, first of all, freedom, the tension between individual freedom, what I want and, and collective freedom, what we need, never more evident than right now when somebody says, please stay at home for your and our safety. And somebody says, no, I wanna do what I always wanted to do. Race, here we are proclaiming to the world and ourselves that we have a country based on the idea that all men are created equal, yet the guy who wrote that sentence owned more than 100 human beings and didn't see the hypocrisy. Um, and we have an, a group of people amidst us, our fellow citizens, us, who have the peculiar historical memory of being unfree in a free land. That's amazing. We have thing, leadership, innovation, art, hard times, politics, war, these begin to come up and we begin to see that it's possible once we've diligently, I hope, worked on a subject, it's really important and possible then to sort of connect the dots and begin to show the way in which history is that great teacher and the way in which history doesn't repeat itself, but these rhymes and these themes and these motifs and these evergreen themes are hugely helpful to us as we confront day-to-day -day life and nothing could be more 
dramatically confrontational than what's going on right now. All right, can, thank you. Can you have a, a new platform uh, to share your work to support educators? It's called Unum. Uh, someone on uh, YouTube, one of the PBS people will put the link uh, in the chat, but it's pbs.org slash Ken Burns slash Unum. Uh, one of the things I really like about it that your team has done is to highlight some particular themes about American history and then connect clips from all sorts of films to those themes, which by the way, there's also a section uh, for teachers of American history, in particular AP US history, where uh, it mirrors the content themes for that course. What I wanna do right now is show our viewers three different clips, all of which connect to the theme of American and national identity. Now, we chose this particular theme not only because I think it, it helps encompass many of the others, uh, but this identity, this idea of identity really becomes a, a touchstone in challenging times. So after each clip that we see, uh, I'd love to get your reaction about what you think that that particular clip tells us about this theme of, of identity. So we're gonna play the first clip now. It is from Prohibition. After the Civil War ended, hundreds of thousands of immigrants, Irish and Germans and Bohemians, and others from Central and Northern Europe began pouring into America's growing cities and spread out across the countryside. They were eager to create new lives, but unwilling to give up old ways, increasing tensions with native-born citizens who thought they knew best how Americans should behave. New immigrants came with not only a different culture, but also with a different set of drinking habits. And that immediately became part of the American debate about whether certain people were drinking the wrong kind of alcohol and too much of it. Eberhard Anheuser, Valentin Blatz, Adolphus Busch, Bernhard Stroh, Frederick Miller, Frederick Pabst, Frederick and Maximilian Schaefer, Joseph Schlitz. A host of German-American entrepreneurs made themselves rich, satisfying the new immigrants' thirst for beer. In 1850, they had brewed just 36 million gallons. By 1870, their output had soared to more than 550 million. To protect their business interests, they formed a lobbying organization, the United States Brewers Association, conducting their meetings and their communications in German. Alarmed at the growing power of the brewers' lobby and the steady increase in beer drinking all across the country, the forces of temperance, dormant since before the Civil War, began to stir again. So I think, you know, what you have there is this classic sense, the, the question that is animating us from the very beginning of our experiment, which is who is an American? Are the natives peoples that were originally there Americans? Are the African-American slaves Americans? Are the newer sets of immigrants? And often this is in conflict. I'm now working on a film right now on the history of the United States and the Holocaust. And of course, in a later period, uh, after the First World War, um, we began to restrict Im immigration extensively, particularly trying to keep out certain people that didn't fit a Northern European idea of who was an American. By then, the Germans were an appropriate immigrant group, just as before the Germans, the Irish were despised and were not appropriate. And so you, you begin to see that each, each sort of... Um, decade or so, there becomes an entrenchment and people begin to resist, thinking that in some way, though America is an idea, we're the only country that knows exactly when we were formed, July 4th, 1776, where, Philadelphia, and what, the second sentence of the declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's an idea. That's the enlightenment boiled down into one sentence. And it doesn't matter who you are. That's what we say, and yet, all, all through American history, the baser instincts are to protect what you have 
and make sure that somebody that's new isn't going to take it away. And so American history is in continual tension from almost the get go up until right now. We're talking about building a wall. We want to restrict immigration, not even with regard to the coronavirus, but restrict immigration entirely. People just cut it off. You know, they're farmers. Uh, big mega farmers out in the Central Valley of California saying, no, I need workers, please send us more workers. But it's an age old American fault line. And um, the damage uh, you can see is going to be extensive in the case of prohibition. Sounds like uh, history rhyming. Uh, we'll take a Very look at, at, our, uh, at our next clip. Uh, this one, Ken, I might have this wrong. It, I thought it was from the Roosevelt's, but is this one from the war? This one is this one is the uh, uh, FDR uh, and his address right after the bombing at Pearl Harbor. So it could be the Roosevelt's, it's probably okay. the war, uh, okay. but I've done this, I've passed through, you know, that this intersection, <laughs> December 7th, uh, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Uh, I've passed through in about uh, 15 of the 35 or 40 films. Excellent. Yeah, it shows up a couple times. I, all right, let's, <laughs> it's a pretty big moment. <laughs> let's let's take a look at the clip. Today, December seventh, nineteen forty-one. The following afternoon, people in Sacramento, Waterbury, Luverne, Mobile, and everywhere else in America gathered around their radios to hear President Franklin Delano Roosevelt ask a joint session of Congress for a declaration of war. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed. We on gathered outside of Langdon Hall at Auburn, and they had a loudspeaker truck. And we stood there quietly and listened to President Roosevelt declare a wall. And of course, our whole life changed. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Like the time we're experiencing right now, the moment of the attack at Pearl Harbor uh, galvanized our country in a way that it has never been galvanized before. The depression had certainly instilled in people a sense of doing with less, but the Second World War required everybody to join in that sacrifice, in a shared sacrifice to get an extraordinary amount of work done in an amazingly short period of time. Though the European nations were almost at it for five years, more than four and a half years, we were in it just barely three and a half years. Three and, I mean, this May 8th is the liberation of uh, Europe day, uh, 75 years later. Uh, that's three and a half years after Pearl Harbor. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, and it had to do with the melding, the conscious melding of our individual identities into one, tethered to the most extraordinary leadership we have ever seen in the 20th century. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a man who could not walk without assistance who lifted his country up and got them through the depression and through the greatest cataclysm in the history of the world. It's amazing. And for me, that's quite moving. That is from our film, The War in 2007. And Catherine um, Phillips Singer uh, there, who is one of the Greek choruses of the film, she's in every episode, just passed away at 96 or something like that, um, Thanksgiving weekend. And um, it's the first time I've seen her picture in a moment. It really, it, it really got me. We become friends. I would call her up. She lives in Mobile, Alabama. And um, I would call her up every couple of months and say, your Yankee boyfriend is um, <laughs> calling you. And she would laugh and giggle. And uh, we had quite a, quite a flirtation going for, uh, more than a decade uh, since the film was broadcast and I'm, I miss her terribly. 
we'll take a look at, at one more clip here. Uh, this one comes from the Vietnam War. The late 60s were a kind of confluence of several rivulets. There was the anti-war movement itself. The whole movement towards racial equality, the environment, the role of women, and the anthems for that counterculture were provided by the most brilliant rock and roll music that you can imagine. I don't know how we could exist today as a country without that experience. With all of its warts and ups and downs, that produced the America we have today and we are better for it. And I felt that way in Vietnam. I turned the volume up on all that stuff. That represented what I was trying to defend. That's one of my favorite moments in my in any of the films that I've worked on over the last 45 years. It's favorite because it's got some of the greatest, the greatest, arguably the greatest rock and roll song ever. George Harrison's Wow, My Guitar Gently Weeps. Anything you put under that tune would work. Um, but you've got here in these three things, you begin to see in the prohibition the way in which the country can go apart. You begin to see in the response to Pearl Harbor, the way the country can go together. Many people believe that the divisions that beset us today, and which I hope this novel coronavirus will help us reset, were born in the Vietnam thing. And what Merrill McPeak, who's a fighter pilot in Vietnam, sacrificing his life every day, uh, putting it in harm's way at least, and he eventually goes on to become the Air Force Secretary, understands that these dichotomies are always resolved by calling in to question the larger things. As I was talking about before, it shouldn't matter where you're from if you've started your country saying all men are created equal. And Merrill McPeak understands that. He may disagree with the anti-war protesters. He may be on one side or the other of the racial story or women's liberation or gay rights or whatever it might be that's beginning to, to percolate or is coming to a huge boil at the Vietnam. But he is saying these are reconcilable opposites. That though we live today in a binary culture and a media culture and in a, a, a a sort of consumer culture, which is focused on the moment, it is possible to reconcile between red state and blue state. It is possible to reconcile between rich and poor, between young and old, between gay and straight, uh, between male and female, between black and whatever distinctions you wanna do, they can be transcended. And to me, the, the final goal of history is to do that kind of transaction. That is to say, to help people move towards those transformations. If you're a racist and live in Brooklyn and Jackie Robinson's coming up, what are you going to do? You can change your team, but they're going to integrate too. You can change your sport, but they're going to integrate too, or you can change. And I think what happens is when we are provided with the stories of us, both the U.S. and us intimately, we, uh, we give ourselves, we put ourselves in the way of having some transformation. So Unum is a way to, after the fact, collect the mixtapes as we've just done here. We've done a classic Unum moment here. Uh, Don McKinnon, my colleague, and his extraordinary team are going, this is an Unum moment because you've, you've married together three clips and we're talking about it. And that's what we're trying to do and relate it to the present. And I'll tell you, I'll leave you with one other thing, which is when I was out uh, promoting prohibition, I would say to people, what if I told you I had been working for several years about a film about um, single issue political campaigns that metastasized with horrible unintended consequences, that it was about the demonization of recent immigrants to the United States. It was about smear campaigns during presidential election cycle. And it was about a whole group of people who felt they'd lost control of their country and wanted to take it back. Now, prohibition came out in 2011 the height of the Tea Party. I mean, 
I was talking about today. And people, I would say, this is all prohibition. And they go, wait, gangsters, flappers, jazz age, and go, it's there. But the more interesting thing are these underlying evergreen tendencies and tensions that define who we are, that are sometimes complementary, sometimes contradictory, sometimes controversial, sometimes majestic in their beauty and their scope. And that's why I've got the best job in the country. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think it's it's so amazing. These three clips are taken from three different films made years apart, uh, made from eras even further apart than that. Uh, and they show very different aspects of the American identity. I, I think you did a, a very good job of, of weaving them together. And I know this is what, you know, as teachers, we try to get our students to see some of those variations on the theme. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, bringing it to present day, um, we know, we've seen for, in some of these clips that in times of great change and upheaval, uh, that sometimes our values and our identity changes. I'm wondering if, if you see some of the kernels of that happening now. Well, I think, uh, David, they change and they stay the same. The, the impulses are there to go off in this direction, but also in that direction, just as we see people hoarding masks and hand sanitizer and PPE gowns. We see people volunteering to go to the Bronx, to the Queens, to Brooklyn, to Harlem, to the worst, uh, worst places, volunteering to go into harm's way. Um, all of those impulses are there. And what you have in these great moments, uh, these great crises as we have right now, are the opportunity to bring up the same old, same old, and the opportunity to really find something in which we can grow on. And the key ingredient there is leadership. How, how do we do it? The extent to which um, Andrew Cuomo has become a huge figure, Anthony Fauci has become a huge figure in our conversations because you see people, bureaucrats in essence, right? I mean, it's so easy to kick the idea of government. And yet the United States government for all its miserable mistakes, and I've charted a lot of them, uh, is arguably the greatest force of good in the history of the world, period. If you take, you know, the national parks and the Erie Canal and, uh, um, you know, land grant college acts and the transcontinental railroad and the emancipation proclamation and the 13th and 14th amendment and child labor laws and labor's right to organize and social security and the GI bill and the interstate highway system and a man on the moon and the affordable care act. You're talking about not a bad track record of achievement that serves humankind. And I think when we look at these bureaucrats who are suddenly we're hanging on their every word. We're watching them grow before our eyes in leadership. That's, that's the stuff that history can compare, can prepare you for. You know, where do you see it? Where do you not see it? Uh, what's happening? Who's rising to the occasion? This is, this is an extraordinary moment for us. And, uh, you know, God willing, in 25 years, I'd love to be able to, to, to be on with all of you and talk about the film we've made about about these years. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> I'm, I'm back in case anybody noticed. Um, I got very startled and get, um, left the Zoom for just a second. So let me get my train of thought uh, back again here. Um, you know, I'm in a little bit of a different position from um, David and Paige as an English teacher. Um, as, an, as an English teacher, my job was to help my, my students look at how a story is told and how um, writers and filmmakers and musicians and others um, make those rhetorical choices in order to create something that transcends that initial idea um, and would typically have my students create um, things that were just were not necessarily always written products as well. Um, so I'm really interested because you're you know, clips from your films were ones that I used frequently in class. Um, as a filmmaker, how in particular does visual media support student learning about history in ways that other media do not? 
Well, I, I just, you know, I can start with the old cliche that a picture is worth a thousand words. I imagine today it's been devalued a little bit, but if it's 250 words, that's a start. We have to admit that we live in a, in a visual culture and that so many of the signs and cues and prompts for the people that you're teaching now are visual and they have been that way for a while. Um, we cannot just stand idly by and wring our hands and say, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And so I think that it's very, very useful uh, to have uh, these visual uh, representations to help draw people in. Um, having said that, in the beginning is the word. My films are written. Um, my first collaborators are writers. Um, I'm not at all afraid of a good sentence. I, in fact, relish that. And we work to polish language to the finest degree. And I would suggest as compelling as the imagery uh, is, as, as wonderful and riveting as the interviews are, um, they are stitched together by words, as we in the United States are stitched together by words, not by religion, not by geography, not by language, uh, not by common heritage, but by words. And so I hope, Larissa, I offer you, uh, you know, a sense that at least from this very, very visual filmmaker, that's what I want to be. I want to show pictures. Um, I also know that we begin with words. And in fact, tomorrow I'm starting work on the editing of a film and I won't be seeing any pictures. I'll just be listening for months, just listening to it. If there's a talking head, I see that. But the rest is just listening, trying to see what the story is, what can go, what, what should be added, um, all that sort of stuff. Before we burden the editors with adding pictures to it, we wanna hear it as, as, a, as a narrative. So in the beginning is the word. I, I quote a, a, a pretty authoritative book. Perfect. Well, that leads into our next question, um, which is research, because you just said you're going to be listening, you're going to be reading, you're going to be watching, you're going to do all of these things. So how long does it take to collect, analyze, and evaluate all these resources? And then how big is your staff? To <laughs> we're at, uh, we're actually, all these artifacts? Um, Paige, that's a great question. We're actually pretty small. Um, we don't have a lot of, I mean, we thank hundreds of people and legitimately so in our credits, but the, every film, even something like Vietnam, 18 hours long, which took 10 and a half years to make, is handcrafted by about 18 people, I'd say, between the, the directors and the producers and the associate producers who are doing a lot of the digging in, in the archival research and the editing teams and their assistants and their apprentices, all of that totals about 17, 18 uh, people in the Vietnam film. Um, you would assume that if you're making a film, you're building something, that it's a kind of additive process, right? It's not. It's subtractive. I, I'm coming to you from New Hampshire. We make maple syrup and it takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. And so you begin to see that we are out collecting in the case of Vietnam, tens of thousands of photographs, tens of thousands of still photographs. And we are uh, doing, having hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, interviews. And we've got uh, a th more than a thousand hours of footage. That's my executive producer, Chester, <laughs> uh, named for Chester A. Arthur, um, who installed plumbing in the White House. I think it was him. Anyway, um, so we've got this amazing process, but it's all to kind of winnow it down. At any given moment, there's perhaps 40 other alternatives that we could have. And so our discipline is to find out what we can't tell. What's the negative space? You know, if a sculptress is delivered a block of stone to her studio, we in the gallery or the museum see only the finished product, but she is hyper-conscious of the negative space of creation, that which isn't used, that which in her process ends up as rubble uh, on, the, on the studio floor, but it's not rubble, it's essential. And what we do is mostly pull out and take away and, and, and discover the story that's hidden amidst all of that stuff that we collect. 
We're going to transition here just for a moment. Teachers, before we get to your questions, and if you've got them, uh, throw them in the chat there on YouTube and, and we'll, we'll get to them. Um, the teachers here, I wanted to, to highlight just a, a handful of tools um, that teachers can put to use here. Uh, many, many of those with us tonight are helping students, like I said, prepare for AP exams or thinking about a, a final project that sort of helps create a culmination for, for the year. Um, Paige and Larissa, I'm hoping the two of you might be able to tell us about uh, some of the ways that you help teachers uh, keep students engaged and create opportunities for student voice. Well, I think it's funny that you talked about extracting and creating a sculpture and getting rid of the negative space because that's kind of the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the curation of resources. I know for me, my job has changed from my first year teaching. I was a deliverer of content mm -hmm. and now people can get content anywhere. So my job as a teacher is to curate content. And that's why I love Kim Birds in the Classroom and Unum so much, because I'm getting extraordinary rich content that I can um, give to my kids. And I know that I'm hitting standards and you've done a lot of curating in your resources. And so that helps synthesize the information for me and my students. So after I curate, that's when the fun and the creativity come in. And so I thought I would share some things with you tonight that I do in my classroom. Um, I've learned that to keep students enga engaged, you need to offer them choice and you have to offer them voice as well. And so I gave you guys a few examples. My first one is a Rough Rider boot camp, And I gave you guys the link here if you wanna check it out. Um, I think probably um, they will be feeding you the link as well through um, the chat box. But this is the Rough Riders assignment. And this is kind of what I would call a break-in. So you break students into the content. And so their goal is to become a Rough Rider. And in order to become a Rough Rider, they have to earn badges. So it's gamification of content. And so taking from the Ken Burns collection in Unum, I've created badges based on subjects that um, have to deal with the progressive era, Teddy Roosevelt and um, domestic policies. So we have character counts, the biography of Teddy, we have immigration, we have conservation, we have all of these things. And the great thing about it is the students get to choose which badge they get to earn first. So they don't have to go in specific order. They have choice as far as um, where they want to begin. I also give them a lot of variety with platforms that they can use. And then they also have variety in demonstrations of knowledge, how they're gonna show that to me. And then if they work individually with a group, with a partner, et cetera. And so just giving them that freedom of choice, which a lot of times junior high and high school students, that's what they're fighting for, will definitely make them more engaged. And then the next resource that I have for you guys, this is a learning menu. So, oh, perfect, we went to the next slide. And so this is more, so the first one was a break in. We're breaking in, we're um, trying to get students to learn background information this is more of the higher level thinking. I do have review, which is your appetizers, which students have already probably already covered this material, but I'm just giving them review if they need it. They don't have to pick the appetizers. They can trade those out for another entree. So we're giving them choice again. If they're like, nope, I've got it. I don't need that. Then they can go, they can pick their entrees. Again, the entrees, you have individual assignments, you have writing assignments, you have a Chinese shadow puppetry show. <laughs> they can create propaganda posters. So it's giving them choice, but you'll notice within these entrees, all the standards that I want to hit are there. And then of course, um, dessert. It's always optional, not for me. It's always necessary <laughs> for my students. It's optional and it's an enrichment piece. So students that are interested in history, students that maybe love art and they want to try something or they love to cook. I'm offering those um, desserts where they can dive 
deeper into the content. And you'll be surprised how many kids go for the enrichment. And I actually had 13 kids. The books were not an option, but the last year that I taught this, I had 13 students go for the books, one on the Forbidden City and one on the Wild Swans. So it was pretty amazing. Wow. That's great. That's wonderful. You know, it's very important that that we wouldn't be here without the public broadcasting service. Uh, their learning media is amazing. And the Ken Burns in the classroom is just one one part of it. And Unum is connected to that. But the mothership is is PBS. And uh, I'm so proud to be involved and so happy to see the way that all of you are adapting it and doing such extraordinary uh, things uh, where it matters most, right on the front lines. And then, oh, there we go. Okay, so this one is my idea, which at least on the surface um, or on the slide, it seems very simple. Uh, Paige mentioned choice and voice, and I am a uh, big, um, and very enthusiastic supporter of student voice in the classroom through small group discussion and Socratic seminar. Um, and then especially the Harkness method of Socratic seminar as well. Um, so my idea, and um, if I have any former students who are watching this, they'll say, mm, yep, this is exactly what she does, is kind of put things forward to students, um, have them select some of those resources themselves, and then write those questions um, that analyze and synthesize the sources that they have so that they can have really authentic dialogue uh, about the sources themselves and how they connect to one another. But probably, you know, kind of more importantly, like we've been talking about, uh, those questions that also get them to make connections to what's happening currently as well with those uh, rhymes from the past. And then really quickly, I uh, just wanted to highlight one assignment I created recently for my AP government students. Uh, my goal here, this was a, a couple weeks ago, really was twofold. One, make it engaging. And two, offer students a great deal of choice in the topics that they were hitting and in the types of media that they could interact with. So this assignment features games, articles, short videos, interactive websites, I challenged my students to make a TikTok video uh, and they responded, we will when you will. So I had to do that. Um, and so all of it was meant to, to hit some really key objectives, but in a way to try to keep students interested, allow for some variation depending on where they wanted to spend their time. Um, a couple of the resources I used in this came from PBS Learning Media, um, including uh, a clip from the Roosevelt's here with FDR and the Supreme Court and the notorious court packing plan, um, along with a couple other clips from the series Frontline. Um, so it was uh, the feedback I got from my students was really cool. There were there were good, interesting things, uh, and sort of like Paige talked about with uh, with her menu, they could take it one bite at a time. Which today in our in our virtual classroom. Uh, is something we you know have to try to balance with students is figuring out uh, how much time in one sitting and what sort of things might might get and and hold their attention. And I think now we're going to transition to some some audience questions. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and. Um... Uh, help you field this first question, Ken. Uh, we've got a question from Sarah. Uh, what do you recommend for students who struggle with history, um, those students who are typically disengaged in class? Well, I, I found that just from my own memory of my own participation in history classes and then watching a, a, a general American public sort of just in an almost a knee jerk fashion, um, turn their eyes away from history. Somehow it's not relevant. There could be nothing more relevant. Uh, Harry Truman once said, the only thing that's really new is the history you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Faulkner said, history is not was, but is. Um, that's really important. To me, it's staring us right in the face. And maybe to some extent, we've shared in the blame for it or collectively share in the blame. The word history is mostly made up of the word story plus high. 
<laughs> it's a great way to get in to anything with anybody. Um, I remember walking into my, I think it was 11th grade history class uh, taught by a man named Mr. Peacock in Ann Arbor Pioneer High School in I guess 70. And um, the Russian history said this course will be from 1861 when the Tsar freed the serfs to the Bolshevik Re revolution, the Russian revolution of 1917. But today, our first day, I'm going to tell you how Rasputin was killed. And for the next 35 minutes, even the people in the back who were trying to hide from history had their mouths <laughs> what? Because he was shot, he was poisoned, he was stabbed, and he was still trying to get up. I have never forgotten that day where he just took history and made it all about story. And then we paid attention. And I think that that's the key. I, I am not a teacher. I don't do the, the hard trench work that you do. I do know these films have educational values, but I'm a filmmaker. I am mostly interested in telling a story. And I know that the laws of storytelling have come down to us since Aristotle's poetics. And we all have to obey the laws, whether we're writing a newspaper article or telling a story like Mr. Peacock in 11th grade in Ann Arbor, Michigan, or you're Steven Spielberg making stuff up, or me where I can't make anything up. Uh, all of us obey some laws of storytelling. And I think that the way to get people engaged is to bring them in with a story. I think Paige, that's what you're talking about. Larissa, that's what you're talking about as well too. Uh, mm -hmm. Choice and voice, and that's a way of giving people a sense of um, ownership of the story. You know, we, we began our Civil War series uh, with the story of Wilmer McLean, who, you know, lived uh, where the first Battle of Manassas took place and a Union shell went into the summer kitchen and he decided, I got to get out of here. And he moved far south and west of Richmond, out of harm's way. He prayed to a dusty little crossroads called Appomattox Courthouse. And it was in his living room that Lee surrendered to Grant. And Wilmer McLean could rightfully say, the war began in my front yard and ended in my front parlor. Do I have your attention? This was always something that always came up, you know, in the last chapter of a Civil War book. Interestingly enough, Wilmer McLean had once lived in Manhattan. <laughs> What? This connects the whole story. And I think that this is what we try to do. And we spend a lot of time trying to find those connections that help us understand. In the Vietnam, if you've looked at that film, I basically unspooled. The f I ran everything backwards from the last, you know, poignant image of Americans pushing excess machinery helicopters off the deck of aircraft carriers. They leapt back onto the deck and moved everything backwards back to a French soldier moving backwards through a rice paddy and then said, okay, forget what you know, let's begin again. And so I would use those two examples. If you wanted to hook somebody on the civil war or just storytelling, show them the first 20 seconds of the civil war and maybe then the next 10 or 15 or do that opening sequence of, um, of Vietnam because it, it's in that is the essence of how we conquer this relatively minor resistance. It's just, it's just inherited. It's been told, the media culture says, look, if you just drive the right car, you wear the right jeans, you smell the right way, everything will be all right. As we now know, it won't be all right. And we now have to fall back on other resources. And the best resource that I know to help us get through tough times is the history we don't. This next question uh, hits home for me. I said at the top, uh, not jokingly at all, that uh, my goal is to narrate a Ken Burns film, but this teacher wants to know, what is it that you, she put look uh, in quotation, uh, what is it that you look for, listen for in a, in a narrator's voice? Um, and this teacher is thinking that this might help guide some students as they're creating video projects about how to, how to connect with their audience. Meaning, meaning, meaning. I think we take that for granted. Uh, how you say something, how you, as I tell my narrators, how you inhabit the words um, is so important. That's why I've gravitated lately towards uh, Peter Coyote and Keith David. They inhabit the words. David McCullough understood the story of the Brooklyn Bridge so he could 
tell it because he knew it. And, and you've got to do that. It's to me, I, I, I was working with John Chancellor, the NBC reporter, and had to break him of some newscaster habits of, you know, in 1909, a man named Charles Hercules Abbott. And finally, I said to him, no, you've got to be like a grandfather who's telling a story. And you're actually going to lower your voice a little bit to pull someone in. And he said, ah, you want me to be God's stenographer. That was to say all of the import, meaning meaning, and none of the whatever, bombast, ego, whatever it is. And I love that. So we look for people who understand uh, how to be invisible, to hide in plain, plain sight, and yet be central to the, the story we're telling. Very interesting. So this is a question from Lisa. Mr. Burns, any thoughts on creating a documentary on American feminism or women's lib or LGBTQ history in the United States? Well, that's a huge set of many, many, many topics. And unfortunately, they do tend to get segregated into one category. Uh, in 1999, we made a film called Not For Ourselves Alone, the story of Elizabeth Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And these are the two women most responsible for women's rights to vote, even though they were dead many years before uh, their amendment, word for word, what they had written back in the 1840s. Uh, came into being, but they organized the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 and worked tirelessly into the new 20th century, into their old age, struggling for it. So we've done that. And I would say that sometimes it's, it's good not to say I'm going to do something about immigration or I'm going to do something on education or I'm going to do something on that. It's just have an inclusive history that permits all of those different things to happen you know, all of those different tributaries to flow into it. I mean, too often we take a kind of narrow, confined view, either a top-down view or sometimes an equally myopic bottom-up view. And we forget to tell a comprehensive story that permits lots of different uh, points of view to obtain. And so it's not enough people say, well, why don't you do something on, on, um, on uh, the Constitution? That's why. I'm doing the Constitution in every film, every film. It's between every line of every film. It's just there. Um, and, and that's the, I, I think what we have to do is, is find that there's ways to tell our stories without excluding anybody. Nobody's narrowing it. People, when you're talking about taking down the Confederate money, people, oh, they're trying to take away money. No, no, no. We're trying to recontextualize it and include it, back it up. We're actually making a much broader and expansive history. And um, that's a hugely important uh, thing for people to understand, I think. Yes. Um, so my question is a little bit lighter, but we got it early on. Um, we are curious as to what your favorite period in history is. Like if you had a time machine, what would you go back to and live in for a little bit? Well, you just saved me by the back half of that question. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I instantly when you say, I, I just want to watch Abraham Lincoln for, for a few hours, you know, I live in this beautiful town. I've lived in this town in New Hampshire for almost 41 years, uh, longer by factors of 10 just about than any other place I've lived in. And I love it. And I just <clears throat> have always dreamed of having a time machine to go back to the 1870s in this town where they had on Sundays in the summer these band concerts. We still have them every Sunday of the summer, these band concerts right on the town green. And no house has changed with the exception of one on the corner, which is a telephone thing, nothing on the town green has changed for something like 150 plus years. I mean, the houses have been kept up and additions have been put on, I suppose, but no house is built before 1830, I don't, I, after 1830. Um, I always thought I'd like to go back if I could take some antibiotics with me. <laughs> Probably a good step. Uh, we got a question from Cynthia on Twitter. She wants to know your your favorite step in the documentary process. Is it deciding the subject, doing the research, organizing, planning, shooting? What is it that you love best? I think there are three. It's hard to really refine it. Um, one is 
One is at that moment when you're shooting, it might be an archive, it might be an interview, it might be a live cinematography and you go, oh, oh good, this will be in the film. Because in that process, you've got to say, every interview, no matter how great it is, if they're in 140th, they're a huge part of the film, right? Um, then there's a moment in the editing room and really that's it. The answer, the simple answer is it's in the editing room. All the films are made in the inter editing room and everybody knows that when I get excited, is when we've got a big problem and we can't get through it. And I get up on my haunches on my chair instead of like, <laughs> instead of sitting still, I'm still at 66 years old, getting up and sort of squatting on my chair, trying to, if I, if I didn't have to eat or sleep, I would not stop until the film was edited two years later. I mean, I just, that's what I want to do. And then there's this moment. There's a kind of post filmic evangelical moment where you want to, just sing the glories of whatever subject you've just worked on, or as we are this evening, collectively the subject of, in my case, American history, which is what I've chosen to tell all of my stories, to practice uh, my craft as a filmmaker in. And so, <clears throat> you know, editing is where the films are made. Uh, I can give up almost any other aspect except editing. Um, but I do love this. I do love the fact that we can, by the way we talk, um, we can evangelize for this often neglected and often maligned discipline, uh, which I have said over and over again, is central to our future. If you really want to know where you're going, you got to know where you are, and you can't possibly know where you are unless you know where you've been, period, full stop. Okay, so this is from Maggie. She said, Mr. Burns, a lot of times history is told by the winners. How do you decide who to highlight and what obligations do you feel to tell the voices of those oppressed? You know, uh, that's true. I can't remember who said it. It's a very famous uh, phrase uh, right now. But in the case of the United States, for example, the Civil War was written by the losers. Hmm. If you look at Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind, two popular interpretations of the Civil War, they posit, both of them, that our original homegrown terrorist organization, the Al-Qaeda, the ISIS of America, the Ku Klux Klan, were the heroes. So how did that happen when we now think, due to extraordinary research by the former president of Harvard uh, College University, Drew Gilpin Faust at 750,000 Americans. We say in our film over 600,000. And at that time we thought it was 620, maybe 650, 750,000. Well more than every other war combined put together um, could somehow end up being written by others. So it reminds us of our obligation to the facts of things. And it reminds us of our obligation to honor varying points of view and to begin to try to understand why someone would be coming from there to not make the other wrong but to try to have a, a much more inclusive history um, facts first uh, but one that tries to have um, a variety of modes of inquiry I think is 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 the way to do it so this is just baked into who I am I went to Hampshire College and almost everything that I've just said in the last minute and a half comes right out of Hampshire College. Um, I am the poster boy for what the transformative nature of that educational institution did for me and will be doing for people for decades to decades to come. I don't recognize the person who entered and the person who came out. And a lot of it had to be armed with a way to see things from multiple points of view and actively go at it. And the best way I could describe it is Hampshire is graduate uh, school at an undergraduate education. If you need to have minors and majors, if you need to have one-on-one courses, it may not be for you. But if you know what you want or you know what you, how to look for what you want, it's perfect. Nice. Um, so we have, I think, one final question uh, for this evening, and this one is coming from Dana. If you could protect one American story in a time capsule to be sent to the furthest reaches of the universe for discovery in the distant future, which story would you send? 
a very descriptive question. That's <laughs> it is, it is wonderful. You know, when we were making our country music film, the last question we would ask everybody, to, every country music great um, that we could find, if they were sending out into a space capsule that one country song, what would it be? So I'm, I'm very familiar with that challenge, at least with regard to, to country music songs. And, and, and Willie Nelson, of course, had the best answer. He said, can they send the songwriter too? <laughs> so um, maybe I, the most important event in American history is the Civil War. Uh, I think that we would have, you know, we, we were able to do a few things at the time of our founding and we left off the table a hugely important thing is that as we proclaimed all men were created equal, um, we still permitted other human beings to own other human beings, American citizens, or at least counted for the purposes of votes as three fifths of a person. And four score and five years later, uh, we started a civil war that um, had nine million people in the South, four million of whom were owned by the other five million. And um, in order for us to continue, we had to end that monumental hypocrisy. It was the costliest war, the deadliest of war. It produced the greatest leadership we've ever seen. And uh, Larissa, as you already know, some of the most beautiful words ever spoken by a president over and over again, from you know the Gettysburg Address to his second inaugural with malice towards none, with charity for all, with his uh, address to Congress in 62, my, we cannot escape history, the fiery trials to which we path will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. And my favorite line, which is the last line of the first inaugural, given when he still hoped to stay out of war, the previous sentence says, we must not be enemies, we must be friends. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. And then this last sentence, recalling the shared revolutionary past that the mostly Southerners in the audience in Washington, D.C., very much a Southern city uh, back then had. He said, the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. I'd like that to represent us. The struggle, the hardship, the hatred, the peace, the love, um, and the beauty of, of that kind of leadership, which we ache for uh, mm -hmm. today as we face, you know, uh, you know, almost as daunting a, a, process, a prospect. Well, wow. So thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time today. Um, you will see a link to download a certificate of attendance in the chat box. The password is history, lowercase. Um, Ken, thank you so much for chatting with us tonight. My and pleasure. It's been very interesting and informative discussion. Thank you. Be well, everybody. Take care of each other. Be safe. Thank you very much for tuning in this evening. Educators and students, uh, please make sure you catch more of American History Night with Ken Burns. It's airing on your local PBS station each Thursday night and also streaming on pbs.org. Uh, I think we have the final two episodes of The Roosevelt's. Uh, they will air tomorrow night. You can also watch the full film uh, on PBS Learning Media through June 30th. Uh, up next, I think as, as Ken mentioned, some of those other films, uh, the next one is the National Parks, America's Best Idea, followed by the war. Uh, teachers, you can find all of those resources mentioned tonight and much, much more uh, at the Ken Burns Classroom Collection on pbslearningmedia.org and uh, Ken's new platform uh, at pbs.org slash Ken Burns slash Unum. Thank you and good night. Good night.